All right, welcome to week 12. The finish line is in sight. Yay. Um, today's lecture has a lot of slides. The slide deck I'm using is the same thing as last week. I've trimmed down the one I'm using in class. The one on Brightspace is the full fat version that has more examples in it for your references. I don't need all those examples to do the lecture. So what we're going to be talking about today is pulling data from two or more tables. Um, so far, I've had a few students ask me, well, can I do this? Can I do that? Yeah, you can. I'm going to be teaching about that like next week. So good. Um, I'm covering actually three topics today, time permitting. Uh, the first two are the important ones, uh, subquery and joins. And they are, they both are used to work with multiple tables, but they have slightly different purposes and different performance implications. Um, and in the SQL joins, even in my current slide deck, there's like four slides on a specific topic that is a little meh. So I'll probably gloss over that and just tell you guys, you know, if you want to know about this, read these four slides. Um, and I'll tell you why it's meh instead of spending 10 minutes on the topic. Okay, so we're gonna start with subqueries. And a couple of weeks ago, I taught you guys about the in operator, where if you wanna retrieve data from one table that has values potentially in another table, and you can use the in keyword, which gives you a list of values. And this is an example from the textbook, but basically it pulls the sum of the extended price, from an order item where the SKU is in this list. Now, the problem is that we don't always know what those values are going to be. So ideally, we want to actually pull them out properly. So we use a technique called um, a subquery. And the way it works is a subquery is also known as a nested query. It's a query inside another query. So essentially, in this example, it assumes you know what the SKUs are. But if you don't know what the SKUs are, and as some of you may be remembering lab six, where I had you guys inserting values, referencing to another table, and essentially the way you did it was you looked up the inserted IDs and used that in your other inserts. That is one way to do it, but it's not always a good way to do it. So theoretically, you'd go and retrieve the SKUs from another table. Then you can take it, take that query and slap it in the first query. So this is known as a subquery. Specifically, what happens is just like in math, there's parentheses. And in math, what do you do with parentheses? You always resolve the parentheses first. So you can use whatever was in that parentheses on the outside. SQL is the exact same way. It'll resolve this query first, take these results and feed them to the query above it. Um, so basically put what that would do is it would pull, actually, you know what? It's easier if I just demonstrate. Uh, does this table actually work for me for this? No. Let's go to here. Okay. I'm using the flight DB because it has the structure I need to do this example. Uh, by now, you should all have the flight DB installed on your laptops. If you don't, you're behind. And you've probably already gotten a zero on a lap. <laughs> so, you know, it is what it is. So let's just say we wanted to know the ID of the country where it was called Canada. So this might seem familiar. Some of you may have done something like this in lab seven. You know, the part where I talked about doing it as two queries, right? I think it's tasks 11 and 12. Now, this is cool and all, 
However, some of you said, well, isn't there a better way to do it than you know, run one query, find a number, populate the second query with the number? The answer is yes. Doing it, it is two queries, but it's an one's an embedded query. It's a subquery. So what it'll do is it will retrieve the ID from countries with the names equal to Canada. It's gonna well, it knows it's two oh eight over here, and it's gonna feed that into this query. Now this works great if you're trying to pull one value, which is cool. Um, however, if you are trying to go something like this. I don't even know if United States is in there properly or if it's in a something else. This will give us an error and I shouldn't have a semicolon there. This will give me an error. Why? Because the subquery returns more than one row. You can't have something be equal to more than one thing at the same time. So if I use in, now it'll give me everything in Canada and the US because it's building a list. So if I run just the inside piece, there's my two IDs for United States and Canada. We know 208 is Canada, 160 must be the US then. So what it does, it takes those two things, returns it basically as a list to the outer query, and then executes the outer query. So that is one of the uses of a subquery. Which is cool. Now, that's what this is demonstrating. So, a subquery is often described as a query within a query, a nested query. It's a subquery. Um, now, the, the big difference is with a subquery versus a join, which I'll be talking about later, is the subquery only ever returns rows from the top level table. So when you look at this, this query, it only returns stuff from airports. It doesn't pull anything from countries at all. It's just giving me stuff from airports. So that's the difference between a subquery. A subquery runs, does its job, and then it lets the outer query run and do its thing. You can use multiple subqueries. You can nest subqueries. You can have a subquery instead of a subquery instead of a subquery. That's cool. Uh, you just have to take into account that for you're just adding more and more things that need to be run. On a small data set, that's cool. On a big fat data set, might not be ideal for performance reasons. And there's an example of a double nested. Uh, you just can you just keep nesting and nesting and nesting to your heart's content. Um, now, there is one other kind of query which is not mentioned here, and that's called a correlated subquery. A correlated subquery is a query where the inner query refers to something in the outer query. And I will demonstrate it like such. So I'm going to go ID comma name from airports, right? So I just want to show you guys this. Now, let's just say I want to pull out, and this is like a really stupid way to do this, by the way, but I'm going to do it anyways, just to demonstrate a correlated subquery. And so, I'm going to run the query, subquery as part of the select part of the deal. And hopefully MySQL doesn't blow up. It ran. So what it's doing is the, the thing about the correlated subquery, as opposed to a regular subquery, is this. A regular subquery is run once. Results are passed out to the parent query. In a correlated subquery, that subquery is run for every row being returned. So 
Before, when I did where country is equal to Canada or US, that query was one run, was run once, results were correlated, passed it up to the outer query, done. In this case, um, that subquery was run 8,107 8, times. So in other words, we ran 8,108 queries. Now, sometimes you need to do correlated subqueries. It has its place. There is a much better way to do it than this. But I, you know, some people do use this for math, where you're trying to get, you know, trying to add up some columns in another table kind of thing. Fantastic. And um, subqueries have one last place you can use them. You're going to use them also in in place of a table. So I'm going to go back to my order samples. So this is something that should look familiar from last week. I just did an aggregate. Also last week I discussed how you can't aggregate an aggregate. Let's just say I want to know what the average order total was. Not the average line total, the average order total. What I could do is actually I'm going to go So I just renamed them to make it easier to work with in a second. Okay. This looks like I'm doing the exact same thing. Technically, I haven't changed anything yet. When you run a subquery, as part of the from part of the query, it's known as what's called the derived table. So you're creating a temporary table in memory. It'll take the results of that query, assign it a name. That's why you see that I have an alias on here as, as some table, because a subquery must have a name. Uh, not a subquery, but a derived table must have a name. At that point in time, for all intents and purposes, it's a table as far as the SQL engine is concerned until the end of the query, then it gets discarded. What this allows me to do is this. And it helps if you type it in right. I now have the average order total. Some people grasp the concepts of subqueries really quick. Some people don't. It is what it is. Um, some people lo really love subqueries and abuse every living crap out of them. That was me when I first started out because we didn't have proper joins. We had the weird Oracle joins, which I'll be talking about in a bit and glossing over. Um, so I just demonstrated all three kinds of subqueries. Subqueries in the where clause, which is used to retrieve values to use to fil filter out. I did a correlated subquery, which was used in the select part, which is you can turn around and you also use that to pull out your um, country IDs. You know, you're trying to insert bulk amount of data and you don't know what the IDs of the countries are going to be or the status IDs or stuff like that. That's where you use that. Or you can also use it in your from clause as a derived table. Um, so you can run an aggregate on an aggregate or Sometimes the underlying table structure changes, but you have an application that needs it to be the same. Therefore, you might create a derived table like this so the application doesn't shit the bed. It just continues chugging along. So those are the three flavors of subqueries. Um, I've used all three. I've used all three in my career. They're very handy. They're a useful tool to know how to use. 
a little bit of practice goes a long way. Um, but as a concept, it's not that hard to understand. It's very similar to math. Do the parentheses, take that, pass it to the outside, magic happens. Uh, if you're not, if you have math problems, you don't know how to resolve parentheses first, you're going to have a hard time with subqueries. But it is what it is. Okay. Now to move on to joins. Joins, on the other hand, is a topic that people will either get right away or suffer. And I'm being completely honest. Over the years, I always said to people, this is easy. You should be able to understand this. And after teaching this for 15 years, I suddenly realized that some people don't find this easy and they don't pick it up right away. It is what it is. A join is a way to query multiple tables at once, similar to the concept of the subquery, except you want to be able to grab the data from both sources and display it. In other words, you just don't want to retrieve a partial value from one table. You want to actually pull data as if it was coming from multiple places and pretend it's all one source of information. And there are two kinds of joins. Well, there's more than two kinds of joins, but there's two styles of joins. There's an explicit join and an implicit join. Um, essentially, there is an operator in SQL called join. If you use the operator called join, it's an explicit join. If you don't use the operator called join, then it's an implicit join. That's the difference between an implicit and an explicit. If you don't have the join operator, it's implied that you're doing a join. So specifically, the kinds of joins you you can encounter are natural joins, which are a terrible idea, but it exists. Uh, inner joins, which is what you're going to be doing 95% of the time, 99% of the time even. Uh, left and right joins, which is, you know, uh, something you use in a special case. Uh, full and cross joins, which are essentially the same thing. Um, full and cross joins are almost never used. They, uh, they serve a very specific purpose. Um, and I'll be um, covering that momentarily. Um, the joins work with tables, views, materialized views, and there's a point missing here, also works with derived tables. So if you create a subquery, that includes like a key in it. Congratulations, you can do a join across it. It's not going to be very fast, but you can do it. Okay, so a natural join. It's a join based on common attributes in both tables. So in other words, the columns share, that like both tables have a column that are named the same thing. So the database server goes, I am clever. Table A has a column called ID and table B has a column called ID. You must want me to join across the IDs. The thing is, if you're using IDs as your primary key in both tables, that's not going to be the truth. Um, so if you do a natural join, it will try to match columns automatically for you. And how many of you have learned to trust your computer to do things automatically for you? Does it usually do what you want it to do? Therefore, natural joins are also known as lazy joins because you want to save yourself about 25 to 30 keystrokes and you're just going to hope the computer gets it right. Yes. Um, yes. They can do both. Um, and it's a terrible idea. The natural joins are just a terrible idea. Um, if there's nothing in common between them, you end up with what's called a Cartesian join or Cartesian product. And the easiest way to do that, to explain that one, is I'm actually going to show it on the board. I keep meaning to create a database for this so I can actually type it in and save everybody my handwriting. Um, but it's actually a really easy concept to understand the Cartesian joins. Okay, we have a deck of cards. 
In the deck of cards, we have hearts. We also have seven, eight, nine. Jack, Queen, King. Hey? Yeah, oh well, yeah, there's a 10. And there we go. Whatever. Wouldn't have made a difference for my example because I'm not going to go down that far. What the Cartesian join does is it takes all the values from this table and matches them up to every value in this table. So you end up with H1, H2, H3. Eventually, you'd get down to diamond, jack, diamond, queen, diamond, king. And you end up with 52, which is a deck of cards. That's a Cartesian join. When do you use this? When you need to create a matrix. Uh, when do you use a matrix? I have no idea. Probably, depending on what kind of job you have, you probably might need a, a matrix for data. Uh, just in my job, I've never really needed to create a matrix. So, you know, it's one of those things. So, this is a cross join. That's a cross join. That's how you do a cross join the implicit way. That's the explicit way. That's the implicit way. Um, and I like this point that the whoever wrote these slides did. This is a logical on database work because we only need rows that somehow correspond to each other. Normally, you don't do this in a database. There's no point in doing this in a database. Um, it's yeah, it is what it is. So now I'm going to talk about the implicit join really quick, and I'm I'm going to gloss over this slide in the next slide. I left them in here for your guys' learning. Uh, the book covers this in more excruciating detail, detail. Chapter two, I think it is. Maybe chapter seven, but I think it's chapter two. Um, yeah, it is chapter two because there's the example written right there. <laughs> okay. Um, so when you use an implicit join, it's the same thing as doing a, an explicit inner join. Other than Oracle, there is no database engine that is able to do left and right joins using the implicit syntax. When I went through school, I learned it on Oracle, and I learned this syntax, because that's how Oracle did joins. This will work in every database engine. Why? Because it's part of the standard. Therefore, they all do it. It's less efficient than an explicit join. So what it has to do, when you read this, it'll go select everything from retail order, comma, order item, where retail order dot order number is equal to order item dot order number. What this is doing here is it'll literally table scan all of retail order, all of order item, and then run the where against it. So it'll pull all the data first, do co the correlation between the two tables, and then return the results based on that which is why the implicit join isn't great. It's just how they did it originally. And you end up with something that looks like this. So just to show that, yes, it does work, um, I can go And I got a typo. And there it goes. It runs. Yay. This is known as an implicit join. An implicit join is very limited in anything but Oracle. Just saying. Depends on what system you're dealing with. Well, it's the IDs of the countries are be randomly generated. The ID of the country in the airports table would have to match whatever it's supposed to be. So even if the system doesn't use auto-incremented keys, it 
has some manual generation of keys. As long as the keys would match, it'd still be cool. So, yeah, this is an implicit join. And so this is known as an equijoin, which is literally another word of saying an inner join. An equijoin goes based on where one column is equal to the values of a column in another table. Thus, they're equivalent, equi, equal. Database people really like, the guys who write textbooks really like inventing words. Um, so you can use joins across multiple tables. You can join every table in the system to each other eventually. And this is two or more tables. Again, it's using the sample. So I am actually going to focus on the join syntax because the join syntax is significantly better. It is currently considered the proper way to write joins, which is why I was sort of like, this is an implicit join. Congratulations to what it looks like moving on. Um, so the, ex the explicit joins have some specific keywords, specifically join, space, table name, space, on. And then it defines how the relationship is defined. Um, the where clause is no longer needed because the join syntax takes care of telling it what the equivalent connection is. There are a few perks to this. I'm going to rewrite my previous query so that it is easier to understand. There. That's the difference between the implicit join and the non implicit, uh, the explicit join. So when you're doing an inner join, the keyword inner is optional, just so you know. Because if you just go join, it's assuming you're doing an inner join. Save yourself, you know, six characters of typing. <clears throat> hey, if you spend your entire day typing, those six characters add up. So the syntax is as follows. Select everything from airports, join countries on, and then you tell it what the condition is to connect them. The, the on clause is the point of commonality between the two tables. Normally, the primary key of one table and the foreign key in the other table. Which is what Lab 6 was trying to teach you guys about a little bit. Right? Remember how you couldn't insert values unless it existed in another table? Otherwise, it would tell you your tool. Basically put, that's what's happening. Um, so, this is great. It works. And how fast does it run? About the same speed, because my database isn't big enough to actually see the difference. Now, one of the perks that this has is it won't operate the where clause until it's done doing all the joints. Doesn't sound like that much of work, but if we happen to have some records in either table that don't match up, which can happen, those get excluded. So that means there's less records to operate against to do the where. So it, it's like a bit of a pre-filtering. Uh, you can actually have multiple parts in the join clause, which is also cool. Um, I could go... And that will also work. Now, some people are going, well, why would you want to do that? We, well, actually here, right in the corner. See the duration right here? What's happening is it's going to pre-filter my list of countries to be equal to Canada first and then do the join. Therefore, I'm joining with significantly less data because I'm filtering it. This is called query optimization. It's just part of making your queries more efficient. Um, like honestly, in this database, a human would never see the difference at all. If you're talking about a high volume system, then you want to start optimizing your queries like that. For now, 
if you can wrap your brains around this syntax, I am going to be a happy camper. Now, I can turn around and go uh, join roots on roots dot uh, source airport ID is equal to airports dot ID. This might sound familiar for people that are working on lab nine. Uh, that's almost the answer for one of the questions. So, although you guys can't really see what's happening, is if I go over here, you can see there's the country data right here. Now, here's the root data because I'm doing a select star. So, it's literally grabbing all the data for every row, I'm just building big, giant, fat rows of all the data. Ideally, you don't want to pull everything back. You want to pull back only the bits and pieces you need. So, This allows us to do one last cute trick. Stop that. Let me go do uh, airports.name. So what's happening here, and this is actually probably the most complicated query you'll learn this whole term in one example. This shows you one of almost everything of today's topics. So I'm retrieving a row, I'm retrieving data from airports. I'm going to connect to countries. So I just want, I want to make sure the countries are connected. Now I'm going to join the routes saying, okay, I want to know the routes where the source airport ID belongs to the airport. But at the same time, I want to know what the destination is. So how do you find out what the destination airport is? Well, you got to bring the airports back into the query. So I'm adding airports back in, giving it another name because you can't retrieve from the same table name twice. That's why I'm using an alias. And I'm joining to that other column in that roots table. Because when you look at the roots table, and let me go pull up just the roots table really quick for you guys. No, I just want you to run this one. There. When we look at the routes table, we have a source airport ID and a destination airport ID. Source airport ID, plane takes off. Destination airport, plane lands. I'm assuming at least half this class of this has been on a plane. And if you're not from Canada, I'm pretty sure you've been on a plane. So at least half this class has been on a plane. And normally you take off from an airport and you hope you land at the airport and you don't land somewhere else, like an express landing. I hate planes. I don't like flying at all. I'm not scared of planes. I just don't enjoy the experience. I don't like the up part and I don't like the down part. Once we're doing this, it's cool. Right, this is not good, that's not good, this is fine. You know, everybody's got their things. Yeah, pretty much, that's why you fly first class if you can. <laughs> so when we look at the routes table, you can see the source airport and the destination airport. And if we wanna pull the names, we have to pull from both. We gotta pull from airports twice. And how do you pull from the same table twice in the same query? You have to pull, you have to give that table the second time you pull from it, another name. So this is by far the most complicated query of today's topic is this. I probably just covered like seven slides during this example. So I might be just going click, 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 click um, going forward. So what's important to remember is the syntax that you use. Join table on point of commonality. This is where knowing how to read an ERD helps. 
or having a, a sensible naming convention helps. Um, there is one other caveat. You cannot join a table to another table that's not already in the list before it. So this is where you learn about joins. It always goes from left to right. And for those of you going, well, your code doesn't go left to right. Well, it does. It's just it so happens that it's broken over multiple lines. Left to right means starting from the leftmost character. You know, and I'm moving to the right, right? Even though it's going to the next line, I'm still moving to the right. So a table cannot be joined to another table that is not already to the left of it. So the easiest example for me to do is see this join right here? I'm gonna slap it up here so that it's joining to roots before roots is ever joined in. And I go run. And now it goes, no, nah, bruh. No, that's what it's literally saying. Look, unknown column in on clause. Why? Because roots hasn't been is not in the list yet of tables it knows about. Therefore, it has to be there. So when you're learning to do joins, that is one of the two most common errors I get students go, it's not running. What's it saying? It's not in the, I don't, it doesn't know what the column is. Actually, they don't even know how to read that much usually. It goes, what does this mean? I don't know, read it. And it's saying unknown column. Well, if it doesn't know about the column, that means it probably doesn't know about the table you're re referencing. Maybe you're grabbing your tables out of order. And the other most common issue I'll see with students is they don't know what columns join to what. Normally you look at the ERD, you learn what the naming conventions are. The flight DB has some very straightforward naming conventions. All the primary keys are called ID. All the foreign keys is table name underscore ID, the singular form. And yes, so this shows one of everything. You might have to say that a little bit louder. Oh, okay. All right, so let's go again, our left to right business. So we're going to, from airports, we're going to join airports on, airports is being joined to routes, but routes happens to be after it. Therefore, it's out of order because it can only join to things that exist to the left. Do them in the right order. Yes, you cannot reference something that does not exist yet in the query. So in this case, roots exists because roots is referenced right above it. We could easily fix this problem by actually pulling from roots first and then um, doing the join the other way around. So we could turn this around and go roots, airports, and this will still blow up because now countries is out of order. So we're not solving any problems here. We're just you know kicking the problem down the street until we take this guy, move it to the end. And we are right back to where we were. It is the same idea. We're just changing what the, the initial connection is to everything. Um, which one's going to be more efficient? Honestly, I couldn't tell you. You'd actually have to run this against, you know, say run this query a thousand times and see what the average runtime is and then start playing with the different combinations of fields to see which one gives you the best results. And considering the database server is going to be learning what you're doing, it's going to optimize the queries every time you run it. It gets really, really hard to find that that magic sauce. Um, but yes, this is an inner join with all the fat, the full fat version. Okay. Okay, yeah, I did this one. Did this. That's a, yeah, did that one. All right, I did this one too, because this is talking about joining two tables. I joined three plus one more for a fourth. So, you know, I said a few minutes ago, I said I probably covered like 10 slides in, while doing my demo. I did. 
Um, three or more tables. Okay, great. Okay, there we go. Some join logic with some pictures for people's enjoyment. So there's picture, there's two tables, one called students, one called lockers. And what we did in this diagram is we aligned the rows just so you can see visually how they line up in the tables. So that you can see that Carter over here has locker number 10. And he's, you know, it matches out to locker 10 here. So they're aligned there so you can see what's happening. So an inner join, and man, I hate when they use Venn diagrams for this, because this is not where you use Venn diagrams. I got something better than this, and I'll pull it up in a minute. Um, so what I've been demonstrating so far is what is called an inner join. In other words, it's an equi join where the data matches in both tables. So the data exists in both tables, so it only pull rows from both tables where the data lines up, which if you're going to use the Venn diagram, it's going to do this, which is also known as an intersection. And that's another example of an inner join. Fantastic. Move on past that. So you got left and right outer joins. Um, so a left join. Actually, I wonder if I can demonstrate that. I wonder if I've got the data I need to do that. Oh, oh, I saw one. All right. That's an example of a left join. Actually, you know what? I'm going to make this easier. I'm going to go customer ID, comma, order ID. Be easier like this. Um, okay, left join. Left join means give me everything from the leftmost table and anything it might find in the rightmost table. If it doesn't find anything from the rightmost table, it'll return a null. So if I scroll down in this, Right here, there, there, here, this shows it really well. This is a left join. And when you do a left join, it means you want everything from the left. It's anything you might find to the right. Again, this whole left to right thing. And if I were to rewrite this so it's a little clearer for you guys, if I put it like this, it'll be a little clearer. So you're going to go, I want everything from customers, left join, orders. In other words, I want everything from customers and if I happen to find anything in orders. And we end up with the following. If there's a value in orders, it'll give it to you if it finds a match. If it doesn't find it, it returns nulls. Now, so why would you want to have this? Because, you know, at this point, some people usually ask me, well, why the heck do you want to do that kind of query? You want to know, you want to contact customers that have never bought anything from you. Fantastic. You want to know what products have never sold. Amazon does this on a regular basis, where they actually list all kinds of products and then trim the catalog a bit of stuff that didn't sell for so many days. Because apparently it's just a terrible item to sell. And how would you use this? You could actually go like this, where go where order ID is null. And now, magically, I only get the customers that never bought anything. See? 32 rows. Or I could go is not null. 
What if I just want to know the customers that have bought stuff from me? I don't care about dead beats that didn't pay give me money. I just want the ones that have paid me stuff. That is a left join. You can flip that around and do a right join. Uh, my data is not set up for that, but essentially it would give you everything from the rightmost table and any matches from the left. It's literally just the opposite of a left join. So left join, right join, they do the same thing. They just flip which side of the operator it's on. So again, left join, let me point at the screen. So when it's a left join, it means it wants everything to the left of the operator plus anything it finds to the right. That's why it's left, right? Left join, because it's join operator to the left, give me everything here and any matches over here. That's literally all there is to a left and a right join. And as outside of the keyword left, right here, there is, um, the syntax is the same. So as long as you learn this part of the syntax, life is good. That's the hard part, is remembering how to use that. Yes, it's the exact same thing. The word outer is optional. Left join, left outer join are equivalent to each other. Uh, this is one of the few places where the SQL language is forgiving with its syntax. There's no difference between a left outer join and a left join because a left join is an outer join. A left join is an outer join. Therefore, outer is optional, just like a inner join the keyword inner is optional because if you don't have the if you don't include either left right or inner it assumes it's an inner join so the lang the language makes assumptions on what you're trying to do there's no such thing as a left inner join just saying do we all need to take a breath and collect ourselves <laughs> All right, right outer join. I just discussed the same thing. Okay, now we're going to compare subqueries to joins. A a subquery and joins allow you to both pull from multiple tables. The subquery is only used to retrieve data from the topmost table. A join is used to retrieve data from any number of tables in the join. With the flight database. Which is kind of cool for you guys because that flight database is actually real data. Um, there used to be this system called FlightAware, and they used to actually publish their database publicly. Uh, what it was, it was always six months out of date, which makes sense. Um, and it was actual real airport IDs, real aircraft, real routes. So there's all the real things. Um, and I used to use it because this course used to have a um, practical exam at the end of the term. And that was the database that was being used. And some of the, and the, the way it was set up is there was three easy, five mediums, and one hard question. And often for the hard question, you were joining almost every table in the database to each other. And it is entirely possible in FlightDB to join every single table to each other. You can join countries to airports, to routes, to airlines, to the Root aircraft to the aircraft, just so you can know what plane flew from what airport and what country for what airline, all in one command. And I saw a hand right there, and now he's not handing anymore. Okay. Well, he put his hand down. So he had his hand up, and then he never didn't have his hand up anymore. So he wasn't handing. What do you think I meant? <laughs> what do you think I meant? Well, I know what he meant. All right. So the last topic for week 12 which actually we're doing pretty good on time, I think, um, is set theory. And 
apparently, um, this now applies to MySQL, all of it, um, up till apparently like 8.0.31, which I don't even think I have that version on my machine at the moment. Um, up till apparently like the most recent version of MySQL, they didn't have this basic set of features that every other database engine has. So, you know, in math, did you guys learn about sets in math? High school math. Come on, I haven't been in high school since 93. How much high school math do you think I remember? None of it. <laughs> so set operations is when you take two sets of data and you operate against it. And normally we use Venn diagrams to visualize sets, which is why it kind of irritates me when people use Venn diagrams for joins, because Venn diagrams don't describe joins, they describe set operations. And have you guys learned about Venn diagrams? Okay, Venn, V-E-N-N, -N, Yee. Okay, some of you, yes, some of you are wondering, and some of you slept through math. So, So, essentially, when you're talking about Venn diagrams, you have setups like this. And you have three different set operators. And apparently MySQL now supports all three. Up till now, it only ever supported union. Um, so, the union is basically everything from set A plus anything in B that's not already in A. An intersection is data that exists in both sets. And a complement, which is interesting, because uh, in math it's called a complement, in Everything else is known as except or minus because Oracle is special and it insisted on using the word minus instead of except. Except uses everything is used everywhere else. It means that everything in A except what it finds in B. Um, so we have three keywords, union, intercept, and except. When you do set operations, they must have the same number of columns and the same data types. Um, so if I were to uh, try to demonstrate this somehow, okay, select uh, name, now let's go select, let's, let's go to flight DB, name from airports, where? Country score ID is equal to 208. All right, so I remember Canada's 208. Great. Now I want to have one sixty. Now this looks the same, except if you look at the bottom, you'll see I went from four hundred thirty five to two hundred and eighty seven. So what it's doing is it's grabbing all the airport names for this country and then the names for the second country. If I scroll down far enough, um, hang on, got to go a bit further down. Um, there, you can see that these are the various uh, airport names in the US. Uh, if I go, I think cities in here, airports, yeah, city. So we have 1,717 rows instead. So what it's doing is it's grabbing all the unique cities from table one, 
and then give me any cities it doesn't find in table two. The unique value is there also. Yeah, it only does uni unions will do the unique values. Uh, there's uh, something called union all, which then pulls everything, which is defeating the point of doing a union. Uh, some people will say, well, what's the point of doing a union? Well, let's say you you have multiple sources of email addresses in your database and you need to run a mailer. So you need to grab every single email address in your database, but they're coming from two or three different tables. Therefore, you're going to grab the email address from table A, union table B, union table C. And it'll only ever give you the unique email addresses so you don't spam the same person 25 times. That's one of the perks of that. Um, the Outside of that, there's that's Union. Uh, I don't know if the version of MySQL I've got running is going to support Intersect. No. So my version of MySQL is not new enough <laughs> to support it. Um, what version of MySQL am I running anyways? Eight dot three. Okay, eight dot zero three. Apparently, eight dot zero three one finally got Intersect. And accept, um, which is totally pointless for this lecture because, well, I can't demonstrate it. I love my SQL. Um, yeah. Try that again. Uh, all in one column, you mean? Well, at that point, you'd want to do a join instead and come at multiple columns. But the issue at that point is that most mailing software only ever wants you to have one column. Right? Uh, so an intersect would give me only the values where the city is exactly the same in both queries. And except would give me everything from, t from the first query except anything it finds in the second query. So uh, going back to my example of emails, that would be if I want to grab all the email addresses in table A, except the ones that I find in table B, because maybe I've already emailed them. Therefore, you want to exclude them. That's what accept does. In other words, everything from A minus B. Yeah. Well, I'm just, this, this is actually a really simple example. I do the same thing. I'm just trying to keep it simple, showing you guys that how it operates. And of course, you know, I can only show the first of the three. And I'm running the same version of MySQL as most of you guys, because I installed it just at the start of this term. <laughs> so, you know. Um, normally what you do with this is if you're trying to pull data from different tables, um, that are that have similar information in them. Now, the other thing about set operations is it operates on the entirety of what's returned. So if I were to add another column to both of these, therefore it would actually compare the full returned value, not just one column, then the other column, it does the entire row. So that suddenly if I were to go city comma country ID, And I run this, look at this, I've got 1,731 rows. Now, people are like, well, what? Because there are repeated city names in different countries. Just like there is an Ottawa in California, sorry, there's an Ottawa in Idaho, Ohio. There is an Ontario in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. There's also uh, Paris, Ontario. There's a Paris in the U.S. They both have airports. Yes, Van Oregon has its own version of Vancouver, right? There's a Vancouver above the border, and there's a Vancouver below the border. Congratulations. You know, there's two Vancouvers. I don't know if the American Vancouver has an airport, but it probably does. This might not be an international airport because this has every airport in it, not just international airports. So. You suddenly you see that it went and I added 20, 24 rows thereabouts to it. 
because there's 24 duplicated cities with a different country ID, so it's comparing the entire row for the union, not just the one column. So that's the gotcha in set operations. You have to realize that you're working against the whole thing, not individual columns. If you're trying to do individual columns, <laughs> um, you're probably going to have to do something else. Maybe do a union as a subquery, pass that out, then do another union, on and on. It gets gross. Um, and this is something you may end up needing to use on, on occasion. Okay. Union, intersect, accept, which I described. So here's three examples of what the syntax would look like. Literally, the only difference between union, intersect, and accept is the word. The two, the rest of it could be exactly the same and it would work. Um, what do you need to remember for the exam about this particular topic? You have to re basically remember, you know, this. <laughs> it's pretty much this slide and those three keywords. That's all you need to know about set operations for the exam. Uh, I don't even think there's even a lab with set stuff in it. Um, which is fine because MySQL limits us. Okay. Now I am going to dive into week 13 for a little bit. Why? Because this will cover pretty much the rest of what you need to finish the assignment. Since there's a week left for the assignment is due, I'd rather almost two weeks for the assignment is due. Sorry, I'm losing track of time here. I'd rather give you guys everything you need to be able to finish earlier than later. So we don't have a case of it's Thursday, three o'clock lab, and the lab is jammed full of people of, I don't know how to do this. Well, I'm just saying. No, I didn't witness that last. I didn't witness that with assignment one at all. A little bit. The lab was the fullest it'd been almost the whole term. I know she's got a question. Sixth of December is the last lecture, which is in two weeks from now. No, all that's all those slides are are actually my slides have less in it. The ones I used here have less. No, because you might need some of the extra jar because the other one has extra stuff in it, like examples and stuff. So I, all I did is I cut it out to make it to make it quicker to go through here. Okay. Now I'm going to go through uh, some of the stuff for week 13, which is I'm probably going to cover views and indexes today and skip transactions for next week. And before I continue, I want to actually word this properly. If I can get a draft of the exam, because I'm still waiting for the first draft of the exam, although I think they're just going to use my exam that I used last term and just update some of the questions. We can all hope because it's properly written in proper English with no weird wording. Uh, how do I know? I've got my daughter to correct it. She sent it back to me 12 times. She was like, oh, you're missing a period here. It's not capitalized correctly there. Like she was doing quality assurance on it. So. It's, you know, it was actually pretty well, not too random. So if I get my draft or at least a, an uh, agreement of what's on me on the topics, I might actually do the review next week for the exam. Like literally I'll finish transactions and then do the review for the exam all in one day. And that means we'll probably have an empty lecture that we don't need, which, you know, some people might appreciate. Okay. Diving into views. So a view is a query that has been stored for reuse. You give it a name, it's stored in the database. Every single time you call the view by its name, the query is executed. 
It allows you to hide the underlying structure. You can take complex queries, make them simpler. And my database prof, when I was in college, would scream if he heard me saying this. You can think of a view as a bookmark. You know, you go to a website and it's got the URL from hell. You know, the URL is like that long. And you go, bookmark, because I don't want to have to type that in again. Right? Next time you go, you just pull up the bookmark. It opens up that complicated URL. And you don't have to know what the URL is because the bookmark took care of it. A view is similar to that. So in MySQL, you'd create the view by using the create command. There's create or replace, but there's a caveat on replace. And I'll cover that one in a minute. So you go create view, give it a name as whatever select statement you want to use. So if I go back to my here, let me just roll this back to my excessively complicated query I had going earlier. Please undo buffer. There we go. Okay, so here's my excessively complicated query from, you know, half an hour ago. It still works. Congratulations. Now, let's say I want to do this, but I don't want to have to um, type this in every single time I want to use it. I can do this. Create view airport source destination as this. So now I'm going to run this query. It'll go zero rows affected. Now what's cool, I can go and it's the exact same thing as before, except now I don't need to know all the joins. The view's taking care of it for me. Yes. Somewhere in the database. It's sort as metadata. Uh, if you look at the schema browser to the left, and I go views, he said, want to know where is it stored? Yeah, so if you look on the left, you'll actually see in the views that there's a view listed. It's not a table, it's a view. It looks like a table. It smells like a table. It acts like a table. But it doesn't taste like a table. It basically behaves. That's okay. I'll go with his wording. I'll roll with it. I'm okay with that. So essentially, the thing is that every time you run the query that uses a view, it actually runs the underlying query behind it. What's cool, um, this is actually the best view I could use for this. Let's go like this, and I go... Uh, Airports.id as source airport underscore id. Um, and this should not allow me to work, do it. Okay. It actually allowed me to do it. God damn. Normally, the replace view doesn't work if you change the number of columns. So I just discovered something else that MySQL lets you do that it shouldn't. Uh, we're going to find out if it actually worked in a second. So here's my view updated a little bit with a little bit more information. So now I have the source airport ID and the destination airport ID. So what's cool about views is I can actually... Do this. And that actually is a really stupid query because that is not even functionally correct. Um, because I'm trying to join the countries to the airport ID. But duh. Um,
So now I'm rejoining the countries back in just for shits and giggles, right? I mean the airports. So I need the rest of the data. So this is just to demonstrate that you can use a view just like you use a table. You can use it in joins. You can use it for all kinds of things. Um, this is another good place to, you know, the whole aggregate on an aggregate thing. You could create a view that does all your aggregates for you and then just use it like a normal query. Um, so, yeah, the, literally that's all there is to views is you create a view with a name and then you save it. Um, some people say, well, can I view the structure of the, 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 the view? Depending on your database engine, the answer is yes. How you go about it is different in every database engine. Go figure. Uh, that's why if you're really lucky, the database engine has a graphical tool that lets you go digging and looking for the results of it. So if I go alter view, it'll pull up the view. Now you will see that it's done a few things to my code. There's a bit more when you look at what it thinks defines a view compared to what I typed in. You can see that there's stuff for an algorithm, a definer, security definer, those you don't need. And then it does the joy of the backticks and it loves its parentheses. That's what the SQL interpreter sees happening behind the scenes. It's just cool looking, taking a look behind the scenes a little bit, see how things are working. Okay. That projector is out of focus, isn't it? I thought it was just me. So there's a class rep telling them, tell, tell them to go have a chat with the uh, their coordinator. Usually that makes things happen a little faster than me complaining. Do you guys even know who your class rep is? You're supposed to have one. Oh. Class rep went MIA. Congratulations. Okay. All right. Continuing with this. So, um, I already covered this. Okay. And I did an example already. Yeah. I already did this example. And so, so, you can alter a view that already exists by using the alter view syntax. Not all database engines support it. And that's where the whole um, number of columns has to be exactly the same. Honestly, you're better doing a create or replace than an alter. Because create or replace, well, if it finds it, it'll actually drop it and recreate it with the replace. Alter just tries to change what's in there. And most of the time, it doesn't work. Um, it's just, you know, some people believe that power of alter is better than power of replace. Um, so essentially, that's altering the view. You can drop a view by going drop view, give it a name, view goes away. Just like you guys learned about drop table, you can drop views just exactly the same way. And this, now there's, Two types of views, dynamic views and materialized views. What I've demonstrated so far is a dynamic view. Congratulations, MySQL does not support materialized views. So this is gonna be a very short topic. Um, I didn't even realize it didn't support materialized views because every decent database engine supports materialized views. Apparently MySQL is not that decent because it doesn't support it. So. A dynamic view is known as a virtual table, a logical view. It can also be called a derived table. It doesn't occupy room on the hard drive. Every single time you run it, the, the underlying query is executed, which means the data is fresh. It's always up to date. Every single time you call the view, it executes the query, pulls the data from the database. Any changes made to the table will affect the result, but they literally, you know, what I just said. So that's why it's dynamic, because it's always fresh. Um, why is dropping here? Okay, materialized views. Materialized views, on the other hand, is a persistent view. When you create the view, it creates a snapshot of the results of the query and stores it. Where? I have no idea. Somewhere inside the database. 
it occupies disk space. And every single time you reference the data of a materialized view, it doesn't run the query. It looks at what's already been run before. So that's why it's called materialized, because it actually makes a copy of the data. Now, in any other database engine, you would create a materialized view as follows. You go create space materialized space view, and the rest of it is exactly the same as a regular view. You define it the exact same way. And what it'll do is it'll actually create a copy of the data, store it somewhere in the database engine, so that every time you call that materialized view, it'll look at this cached copy. Therefore, it doesn't have all the overhead of doing all the joins, of doing all the where stuff. It's already pre-filtered. And to drop it, you go to drop materialized view, give it a name, and it's gone. Um, now, if we could actually do this example, um, it'd be great to show you guys, but I can't. So here's the difference. If I were to pull from a dynamic view, I add a new city to the Canada table. The dynamic view would see this new city. The materialized view will not see the new city. So that's one of the big problems with materialized views is that the data is never fresh. The second you ran it, every moment after you've run that initial creation of the materialized view, the data is getting more and more stale. which means the data will be inconsistent with what is live. It'll be out of date. So now at this point, I've got, I, there's at least one person in here going, well, why would you want to use materialized views? Eh? Nope, because materialized views don't get backed up when you back up the database. What do you use it for? Um, you use it when you have really expensive queries that need to be run, but that don't need to date data. Have you guys come across a term called data warehousing? Some of you have heard of that. Data warehousing means you take the data from a given day, you summarize it, and you shove it into another spot so that whatever summarization doesn't need to be pulled on every day. For example, at my day job, we have a system and it uses materialized views. What it does is it summarizes the data up to midnight of the day before. So every time they wanna pull up the dashboard to see how the sales are going, they don't really worry about what's happened so far today. They worry about what happened the day before so that they have a complete daily view of the data. So every single night, there's a batch job that runs, and it runs literally something just like this, which is refresh materialized view. What that does is it purges the stored data and recreates the data. In other words, it's refreshing the data in the materialized view. And this is just another example, you know, delete the city, add it back in and it goes away. You can only see it. Um, so, Actually, let me just show you guys a spot where materialized view is being used. Uh, I can't show you the materialized view itself, but I can show you one that's using it. This is a materialized view. Well, actually, it's multiple materialized views. This is the weekly sales summary. This is the sales over the last 12 months. This is the year over year sales. And then this is the total sales graph over history for this product. And as you can see, it's pulling data back from mid 2011. And the page loads that fast. Why? Because it's pulling on materialized views, which are static. That means the data has been defined. It's already been pulled. Therefore, it's just doing a select star from whatever the view is. Oh yeah, it it was uh well, actually it, it's oh materialized views are almost an overkill for this system because the back end is so freaking fast, but it's still about a uh, it was about a three hundred percent speed improvement. Uh, 
how how much how much RAM does it use? How much that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So Amazon uses materialized views extensively because they'll run summaries, and then they. They run their summaries on a regular basis. I'm just trying to see if I can pull up one of these queries so I can show you guys just how complicated they are. Um, I'm just hoping I have a local copy of it because I can't connect to work right now. It's not working. Come on. Holy cow, it's usually not this slow to launch. Come on. Any time now. I have no idea why it's not working. Yeah, no shit, it's taking longer than usual. Oh, I have no idea why this is taking so long to launch. Okay. Hang on. Drop it. There we go. Okay. Hey. As you can see, this is a really complicated query. This particular one is what populates this graph of the blue bars. This is not a query that runs instantly. Just saying. It literally sums up the sales for every year, and it actually does some sorts. And by the way, here's the unions being used in this one. Somebody was asking, when do you want to use a union? There's It's using a union. Yes. The, in the initial version, about 10 minutes. I do this for a living. This is what I do for a living. I mean, as I said, the initial version, then there's probably maybe a half hour to 45 minutes of tweaking after. But yeah, it took me 10 minutes to figure out how to write it. But I mean, it's, I'm sure everybody in here has probably got skills that I don't have. No, I, I shit you not. I had a student one year that taught me about 3D design for 3D printing. I had no idea what I was doing. The guy came in and gave me lessons. So it's just an example of, you know, different skills. I've been doing this for 26 years. Lord, I hope I can write this in a in half an hour or less if I've been doing this for 26 years. I don't expect you guys to pull this one out of your hat. Heck, I look at it now and go, what the heck was I thinking? Uh, I was thinking I needed to make this run. So that's what I was thinking. Because the framework I was using did not like this query. Because what happens is I use a programming framework that abstracts the database layers. And the, ab the abstraction does not like this kind of query. So I had to create a way to make it happen, which this is what this was. It's cool. Um, you want to close the dialogue? Yes. And if I were to go, um, yeah, that's what this is. And this is what the data looks like coming out of that big query. You know all that all that code to give me that, but you know, so that's just to show you guys that's where you use materialized views is for stuff like that. Um, now to finish this because we're almost done. Um, so when you talk about updating a view, it means you're referring to your adding, modifying, and data using uh, modifying the data using the view. However. Views don't like you doing that because you have to include every primary key for every table used in the view. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't know what it is you're playing with. Most of the time, the point of using a view is to abstract that stuff. So 
I don't know why these slides are way out of order. Um, I, I even looked at this yesterday and I didn't even realize it. And you know what's worse? I noticed this last summer when I taught this material and I forgot to update these slides after the class. Um, okay, what time is it? Excellent. So, you know what? I'll do indexes next week. It's fine. It's like a five minute topic. There's two other topics after this. So, what are you guys supposed to be doing before we all pack up and run away loudly? Okay, number one, do your effing hybrids. It's a shitty way to lose points. Your hybrids. Don't forget to do them. There's two tests left, two quizzes. Three and four is the second half. There's slides that feed into them. No, it's too late. Okay. Lab nine and your assignment. Yes. Hey. Email me. Just email me them group members. It doesn't take very, it does, it takes me five minutes to create the groups. All right, you guys can run away. <laughs>